And what I'm going to be doing is introduce some fantastic panelists for you. But what I think we'll do is I'll bring them on one at a time and seat them as they come up so that you know exactly who's who and who's talking and all the rest of it. So I'd like to start with Elaine Gonvec, who's the CEO of Curie House. Come on up, sir. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Elaine, pleasure. Thank you. There. Next up, Neelish Bhatnagar, CEO at Emacs. Come on up, sir. <laughs> pleasure. All right, Naveem Khanzada, Head Omnichannel Retail Jumbo. <laughs> Sir, your employees keep winning my raffles. You should have a word with them here. All right, and finally, Mr. Robert Wilkins, he's the Commercial Director of Extra. Thanks very much. All right. So I thought we'd make this all nice and civilized and I'd sit down with you. Now, I've, um, I've sort of introduced you, so I'm not going to ask you guys to like, say, hi, my name is. But what I'd like to start with, starting from you, Elaine, is tell us a bit about your business. So a short, succinct, brief introduction about what it is that you guys do, your retail operations, and what you think are key issues. So like in a brief blurb, let's have a go, Elaine. Okay, so I'm, I'm representing uh, Holy Home from Lebanon. Holy Home is, a, is a, used to be a family-owned company. It's a hundred million dollars company. Of course, uh, our main difficulty today is the market. Uh, we are living and working in a shrinking environment. Uh, and because of political constraints, because of the political instability of uh, Lebanon, so this has been going on for the last uh, three, four years. So we have to cope with that. I think one, one of the targets of Khoury Home and the reputation of Khoury Home is based on uh, an excellent level of service to the customer. So this is where uh, Khoury Home stands out uh, among the competition. So this is one of the key area where we are working. We want to secure, to enhance and to grow uh, the service that we are offering to our customers. Super. Uh, Mr. Neelish, over to you. Tell us a bit about Emacs. Yep. Um, hello. Is that is that is this mic on? Hello. Yeah. Is that okay? Um, I can't hear you, so I'm not sure other people can. Uh, could you very quickly come up here and sort this out? I'll come back to you, sir. In the meantime, um, Nadim. Yeah. Um, tell us about well, Jumbo. Well, Jumbo has been operating in the UAE for the last 40 years. Uh, started off mainly as a distribution company, distributing Sony products exclusively in UAE. Over a period of time, we've added uh, many more brands, and today we distribute close to 20 world-class, world-leading brands in their respective categories. Uh, there are three main business verticals within Jumbo. So one is the distribution business. The other is uh, value services, which is enterprise. We have after-sales service. We've got a 3PL logistics facility in, uh, in Jebel Ali, which we outsource for other categories uh, and uh, pe people in other industries. And the third vertical is uh, retail, which uh, I head. So retail consists of 20 stores in the UAE, the brick and mortar stores. Six months ago, we started our online portal, jumbo.ae. We integrated it to become omnichannel. And uh, last year, we also started uh, operating franchise stores for one of the telco operators here, which is uh, Do. We operate 15 stores uh, for Do in the UAE. So, I'm going to stop you there for just yeah. a quick second and say, let's take a quick look at the market issues as well. All right. I'm going to be opening the floor to questions, ladies and gentlemen. So put your smart caps on, make some notes, anything you want to ask. Never a better opportunity. We've, we've got some of the best and the brightest here. So ask them anything you want. So we're going to save time for your questions. So start jotting them down. Um, key concerns in the market, rather quickly. Well, apart from the regular ones relating to, uh, say, grey market, pricing, higher mall rentals, uh, saturated market, uh, I think the biggest challenge really is uh, that the consumer behaviour is changing faster than most of the retailers can actually adapt to them. And uh, the consumer seems to be a step ahead of the retailers mm. in uh, deciding what he wants, how he wants it. So. 
it's a completely changed scenario from maybe five years ago or 10 years ago when the retailer really wanted, uh, really knew what they wanted to do with the consumer. Now it's the reverse. Now it's, now it's So that is reverse. the biggest challenge. I mean, being relevant to the customer. Super. All right, Mr. Nilesh, I'm coming back yeah, to you different. very quickly, Emacs, because I have a few questions to ask you guys. Right, Let's keep yeah. this short. Hello, hello, everyone. Emacs, we, we, we are one of the late entrants in the business of electronics. Uh, we started about eight years ago. We have a retail division under the banner of Emacs, have about 60 odd stores across the GCC. We also have a distribution division, Max Electronics, distributing some international brands as well. Uh, I mean, in terms of the key sort of issues in the, in the market today, you know, I feel, uh, you know, one of the m most important uh, shift that's going to happen in, in, in very near future is going to be the emergence of e-commerce, frankly. And it's going to hit uh, electronics industry, ele electronics, brick and mortar retail the, the maximum. Uh, that's something that we need to cope up with. I mean, I am a brick and mortar retailer for the last 30 years. So I, uh, you know, I'm very passionate about brick and mortar retail. I hate to see e-commerce growing so fast, so rapidly, but I'll have to take it up uh, as a reality of life and cope up with it and make sure that we do equally well in e-commerce as we do in brick and mortar. I'm telling you that you're a brave man to come to Distri and say, I really hate e-commerce <laughs> and I wish that it would go away. But, and there's somebody clapping at the back, all right? No, but actually, I think, yeah, we like those statements. So that, that merits a round of applause. Now, Robert, over to you. Tell us a little bit about Extra. Yes, yeah, so uh, Extra, part of the United Electronics Company, uh, predominant market is Saudi Arabia. Uh, we also have business in Bahrain and Oman. Um, I guess just to follow uh, the gentleman's uh, sort of feedback, uh, we have a number of challenges within Saudi Arabian market uh, currently, but I think that our biggest challenge is just really uh, focusing on our customer and ensuring that we're actually uh, gaining their trust and loyalty and working with Extra. So I think as we've seen, there's been a number of uh, great presentations about Internet of Things and the great advances in technology. And frankly, I think that I embrace the actual change that has taken place in retail. And certainly at Extra, we're trying to sort of stay at the forefront of that, embracing e-commerce and uh, the Internet of Things as a category in a ho as a whole. So you guys aren't going to be working together anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, super. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, some very interesting things that have been uh, thrown out here. And specifically, I mean, it just seems from what you guys have said, and this isn't on my question list at all, that retail's in a little bit of trouble. Because you said saturated market, right? You said you hate e-commerce. You said there are challenges. You said you're in Saudi Arabia. Um, it, it, well, I didn't mean it that way. But what I'm saying is, um, is retail in trouble? How about the gray market? So there's two things. Let's talk about it in two ways. The gray market and e-commerce. Um, are you guys being pressured from all sides? What's going on here, Alain? Well, uh, about the, the e-commerce, I would like to, to build on what Nidish said. Uh, I, I think we are at the transition period, and uh, I don't want to seem too old, but I remember uh, 15 years ago, um, the expectations of the e-commerce were extremely high. And when we look at the actual numbers, they are nowhere near where we thought they would be 15 years ago. So we have to take this... Uh, into considerations. We need to be omni-channels, of course, but uh, I still believe also in brick and mortar, and we have to add uh, other channels of distribution for, for retailers to help us consolidate and grow our business. Super. Nilesh? Um, yeah, I think your favorite hobby, e-commerce. <laughs> yeah. um, and I also, mean, when you're addressing it, I mean, one of the things um, is, if it is a challenge, does it affect your pricing strategies? Like, are you cognizant of the fact, all of you guys, that, oh, there's someone out there selling it cheaper and my consumers have access to it now? Because one of the things that the standard internet's done, of course, is price comparison. Price competition has been made extraordinarily easy. I've been here and I've been talking about the customer experience and yet, yes, that counts, but how much does it really count when you can access a broad spectrum of prices throughout your city and go, Right, I'll just go buy from there. So um, address that a bit as well. See, but first, I mean, e-commerce. Talking, with... talking of the grey market, I think you know, grey market and e-commerce go hand in hand. E-commerce and gr the grey market go hand in hand. Absolutely. So, um, so essentially, like everything in, that is being sold in e-commerce is grey. Lo lot of it. Okay. 
And, and it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Mm. It's a challenge for pricing. It's a challenge for uh, you know for for the consumer for us to you know satisfy the demands of the consumer in terms of pricing because you know they perceive the product to be the same, although yeah. it may not be. Uh, Will the product not be the same then? I'm I'm not sure. I mean, okay. if it is exactly the same as what it is procured mm. through the authorized uh, channels, frankly. Yeah. I mean, Jumbo, um, a few interesting things, e-commerce, grey, yes. vendor pricing, yeah. your take on this? Well, my take is a little different to, uh, to Nilesh's. Uh, the reality is e-commerce is here to stay. And uh, the disruption which technology has caused in the last uh, 10 years, in the last 10 years, we've actually progressed more in technology than in the history of civilization. Hmm. And right from our interactions with each other, I mean, each one of us carries a smartphone, looks at it probably 200 times a day to check our emails, Facebook or WhatsApp or something else. The interaction in the house has changed yeah. because everybody is generally constantly connected on the phones. The way we shop has completely changed. Yeah. 10 years ago, you walked into a store, the store salesperson was king, he had the information, you you had a word with him and then you had to decide whether to buy it or not. Yeah. Today, you browse in your house, you come to the store much more knowledgeable than sometimes the salesperson. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for you in terms of pricing and also in terms of, uh, well, choice and pricing, well, really? Pricing uh, is secondary, but the first thing is we actually have to adapt to what the customer wants. So we really have to give the customer what he wants, where he wants. Right. Yeah. Pricing is a, is a separate channel and there I agree with Nilesh that uh, in the UAE, and I'm really talking about the UAE and GCC, the e-com space is dominated in the electronics industry by grey market mm. operations, which is not good for the industry because there's no price stability, so the vendors uh, are suffering because of that. It imbalances the price. The customers don't really know whether they're getting something which is genuine, which is what it's, it's supposed to be, whether it carries the warranties and after sale service. So overall, the experience is not very good. And that is something which the vendors really need to, uh, to actually take action on. Because the brick and mortar stores, which is still 99% of the business of uh, electronics retail over here, cannot be struggling because of this 1% disruption. So right. that is something which needs to be addressed by the, by the vendors. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Robert, your take on Martin? Yes, yeah, so I think that uh, within Saudi Arabia specifically, we've got one of the highest adoption rates of YouTube yeah. usage, for example, in the world. And I think that uh, we're certainly ad ad adapting as a business to the fact that the internet is, uh, you know, certainly just the growing sector. And I think that, you know, retail the world over just needs to continue to change and adapt. And I think that we see it as a very exciting period. I think that we're seeing very much more customers actually coming into our stores, more informed. They've done their research online and so we very much see a customer journey whereby people are researching online and then they're coming into stores to make their purchases. I think from a pricing perspective um, maybe in Saudi Arabia we have less disruption on grey pricing but I think that it does exist and I agree with the point that there needs to be more control uh, certainly applied from the vendor side but I think that arguably pricing actually encourages competition and I think that we're very much uh, in favour of actually the uh, sort of um, retailers that are just actually pure play uh, online retailers and equally our bricks and mortar sort of competitors. We embrace the competition because it's good for the customer and I think it's our responsibility to keep to adapting and evolving and making sure that we try and actually support the customer needs that they've got. But those needs are very much more now about uh, you know, uh, the use of the internet. They are finding prices on there, they're comparing to our competitors yeah. and we have to make sure that we've got a proposition and a differentiation that ensures that that customer comes to our store. You guys have said this, you've said this, differentiation, you said customer service, and you, you've just said, it, it's a term that's thrown around quite a bit, the experience, the overall. What is this experience? I mean, if I want to buy a phone, mm. explain to me from the retailer point of view, if I, uh, what is the retail experience that would draw me into a shop when I'm half a click away from Amazon, or I've got like a, a number of local brands who by now, will bring me a pizza as well as the phone and say we'll take cash. <laughs> like, do you know what I'm saying? So just clarify that for me. When you say experience, what do you mean? But I think when you're actually looking online, you've not been able to physically touch the product. You've no. not been able to actually sort of stand in a store and actually have an HTC handset in one hand, the M9, and you've not got the Samsung S6 in the other. You've then not been able to stand in the Apple zone within our stores and actually be able to sort of play with the technology, feel it, touch it, and actually sort of, you know, 
see as well the other accessories and other technology that's in the store. It's also the ability to speak to a colleague that can actually talk you through some of the features and the functions of the device. So yes, online you can read about the features, you can see the prices, you can compare price, but it's when you get in the store and you're in the final sort of the, the final meter before that purchase is when you really uh, become at one with that device. Yeah. Uh, to, to add to that, apart from the, the touch and feel and the human connect which you have in the store, uh, the other differentiation, and that's something which actually we've just started now, is uh, if you're, say, a mobile phone buyer, and uh, most of the people change their phones now within six months or within a year, the first question is, what do I do with my existing phone? So you walk into our store, you'll get a trade-in value, which you can use to buy your next purchase, your next mobile phone. There's an entire accessory ecosystem around it, which you can touch, try, have it installed. Uh, we've, we work with the telcos, so you've got uh, the data plans and phone plans, which are available in store. You can change, modify your plan. Uh, finally, you want to transfer your contacts, transfer your data from one phone to the other. You guys so, will do that. so we've got a booth over there, which helps you do that. So this entire customer journey, where earlier a customer came, bought a phone, and then walked outside, and then went to a telco, went to an accessory shop, and went to somebody who would uh, transfer his data, that's now all aggregated into one store. So which is that a customer unified experience, point of contact, unified experience, mm. which online cannot offer. So there are certain differences uh, which, which an in-store can offer over online. But of course, both have their own Super. advantages. Mr. Neelish. Yeah, I, uh, talking of customer, customer experience, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a very loose terminology, very wide terminology, I would say not loose, but very, very mm. wide. It's, it's a, a subject on its own. It starts right from the time when you sort of pick up the paper and see an ad of a retailer in the paper, and that's when your customer journey starts, customer experience starts, has to understand the promotions, and then pre-sales, during the sale, selling period, after sales service, uh, you know, it goes all the way. It's, it's, you know, in electronics, I think, unlike fashion and shoes or any other product category, uh, you know, there's a, there's a long-term relationship between a customer and the retailer, you know. How? But now, aren't electronics fashion accessories as well? Because the average turnover yeah, time is. on a pair of shoes is a year and a half. On a phone or mobile device, it's five to six months. It is, and, and yes, I mean, in, in, uh, in other industries, in other, other product categories, there isn't so much of uh, explaining to do as what is required in electronics in terms of explaining the... It's all about electronics simplified. That's what we follow at Emacs. You know, right. you simplify the electronic jargon and you talk to the customer the language that he understands and not really yes. a, okay. a very technical uh, jargon, yeah, yeah. you know, that the only industry people understand. You know, so all of that, uh, you know, giving the experience exactly what Nadeem was just mentioned, that look, you know, it's not, it's not about selling a box, selling yeah. a brown box, it's about selling an experience, selling a utility to the customer, not Super. the product. Alain, what do you have to add? You brought up customer experience, you'd better have something good to say about it, is yeah, all I'm saying. I think one of the key issues is really to, to build a, a trustful relationship at the end of the day, because it's not a one, uh, what we target also is not uh, a once, uh, a one pure experience. Uh, if you build a trustful relationship with the retailer and the customer, um, it will last a little bit longer. So I think yeah. that, that's the key moment. It's not only how you walk in the store and what you feel in the store, it's specifically what you feel when you walk out of the store, what you retain from your uh, store visit and what you will retain in the years to come, in the months to come. And you think that will bring people back to you? Exactly. So you become exactly. sort of like the expert friend, exactly. the go-to person. Exactly. And, and sometimes it's, say, it's to say, no, I, I'm, it's, it's, I'd rather not to sell this product to you because, yeah. because you're the expert, you're the advisor. Okay? Right, yeah, you're yeah, not yeah. here to sell at any cost, at any point. You are here to advise and to build this trustful relationship with the customer. Interesting, okay. yes. So. So maybe bricks and mortar channels are taking on a more advisory role. No. This maybe this neatly um, dovetails into uh, another thing that I've been concerned about, uh, uh, and that is, but you've actually got vendors now opening up their own bricks and mortar stores, right? So Apple's coming into the region formally, officially. So the Blackberry, Blackberry stores are already here, Samsung stores, etc., etc., etc. 
How does that impact your business when you're talking about, specifically because you were talking about um, the consumer experience, and how does that sort of, is that a challenge? Is that something that keeps you guys awake at night? Like, oh great, now they're here as well. Robert? I, but I think, to my earlier point, I think competition in, in the region is, is good, and I think that having come from the West and worked in London and, and America, I think that you know, Apple stores exist there. That doesn't yep. mean that, that you know, the businesses I've worked for before, like Best Buy and Dixon's Carphone, suddenly go out of business. Yep. I think it's, again, trying to find a way to adapt and actually make your business have a point of difference, as we've spoken about before. I think service is absolutely a critical area, but Apple doesn't offer every brand. It doesn't offer the choice Fair to play, the yeah. consumer, and yeah. I think that that's something that we do offer, is, mm. is that choice of product, different categories. So it's you know, like you said, you can actually hold the HTC and the Samsung and the Apple together yeah. and go, right, you can compare you can't the devices, and, and you know, we, we offer and would, and would focus on the service, as the point was made earlier, to ensure that that customer can compare all the different products and, and can actually have a great customer experience in our stores as well. We've just only seeing an Apple device. Super. Nadeem? Uh, the brand stores actually cater to brand loyal customers and they're more, to, more about create or giving the best brand experience and showing the brand in the best light. So you, you'll have all the products available over there uh, for the customer to experience the entire accessory ecosystem. And uh, generally, it's about creating better brand equity with the customer, mm. whereas I agree with what uh, Robert says. In the multi-brand stores, you've got choice. So a customer comes and sees everything that's available to him in that environment. So it's, it's a little different. However, the number of brand stores that are opened in the market uh, should be restricted. I mean, you can't have brands opening stores in every mall Right. and then competing with the, with the, uh, the existing brick and mortar But retailers. you're saying that as a retailer, not as a consumer? As a retailer, yeah, yeah as, a, as a retailer, yeah. But is there but any way of restricting them? Well, it's, it's, it's a decision that the brand stakes. So right, somebody yeah. like Apple would open only probably one store in the yeah. city like Dubai, one in Abu Dhabi, which is fine, but there are some brands which open multiple stores in every mall. Yeah. So that yeah. can be a... Uh, what's your experience here in Mr. Nilesh? See, the brand stores, in fact, I feel they, they, sh they should complement the multi-brand retail outlets mm. like Emacs and Jumbo and all, all of us. Uh, you know, it, Complement it's, how? It, 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 it complements in a way that, first of all, uh, I think it, it uh, sort of pulls the, you know, the, the, the attraction, it pulls the mind of the consumer towards electronics as an industry in the first place, providing that experience and the lineup. They can see the whole lineup of the, of the brand which uh, you know we would not be able to provide for for every brand to have the entire lineup okay yeah uh, you know so we we only go by the top sellers uh, you know formula right uh, so overall i don't see that as a threat to multi brand retail i feel they complement the multi brand retail but of course the the number of stores should be controlled it should be more of a exper experience yeah. zones rather than a, a place to sell alan I think well, it depends on the markets, but I think the, the control will come by itself by the profitability of the stores because today it's a, it's a brand investment. Mm. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, this will be measured as well. Um, I'm, I'm, I think that the, the brand equity of Apple is somehow unique and it will be very difficult to, to be reproduced. So I'm, I'm, I'm confident that the market will uh, uh, stabilize by itself. Now, what you guys have spoken about when you said that the stores should be restricted, it's basically that comes down to the vendor-retailer relationship, right? And that's basically what you guys have been doing in lots of meetings and all the rest of it. So I'm going to say, I'm going to ask you guys, do vendors and distributors work well in this region? And if they don't, or if, you th or if there are gaps, what can be done to improve it? Because as a consumer, personally, I sometimes have felt back in the past that, you know, like, you know, Apple's habitually like eight months late here. Um, uh, quite a few channel dis uh, distributors don't exactly know what's happening in the, in the, brand, uh, in the brand. So I'll, I'd like your opinion on that. Robert? Yeah, so I think that um, it's certainly true that between the vendor, the distributor, and the retailer, there needs to be more of a, a seamless working uh, relationship to ensure that the customer isn't negatively impacted. I think that certainly within Extra, we try to actually have direct relationships wherever possible with, with our vendors so that we can actually uh, get to market for our consumer uh, quick, as quick as possible. I think that you know, it's ultimately having the better relationships between vendor, distributor, and retail that will actually ensure that the customer has the better offer. I think it's not really... Uh 
as bad as you described it. Yeah, uh, really. most, most of the <laughs> re just retailers, say. distributors, and vendors uh, are working seamlessly. Uh, there are, yes, there may be some areas of improvement, but generally in the Middle East now, with the Middle East now becoming one of the key markets hmm. for most of the vendors, okay. that scenario is changing. And the example that you gave of Apple, yes, uh, five years ago when the first iPad launched, it came six months late to the region, but now when the iPhone 6 launched, it came within 12 days to the region. Fair play. And uh, these things are changing. So I okay. think uh, most of the vendors have also realize the importance of Middle East to their, to their bottom lines and to their sales. See, I've seen this, uh, you know, this change uh, you know, over the last eight years that I've been involved in, with this industry. I mean, initially, it used to be a very strong, uh, it was a two-way relationship between distributor and retailer. Vendor was not in the picture at that point of time, but I think over the last eight years, it's become a three-way relationship. Mm -hmm. Vendor is equally involved in what's happening in the market. They, they, the, the joint meetings take place. Okay. Uh, you know, the strategies are discussed, the quarterly business plans are discussed. Between the vendor, the distributor, and retailer, it's a joint effort, so there's a very, there's a great, great involvement from the vendor, which is, which is, I think, in the right direction, you know. Um, would you agree from a Lebanon market perspective uh, that the vendor-distributor, you guys are actually talking? I would agree that the, the, the relationship is, uh, is basically healthy and uh, I think that, that's the only way to build and to grow profitability for both uh, sides of the business. Um, if there is a fight, um, I believe that both sides will end up uh, losing. So this is what has been going on for the past few years in Lebanon and I think it's a, it's a very healthy uh, relationship. Yes. Okay, um, guys, I'm going to open the floor to questions, so get your questions ready um, in just a couple of minutes. Um, we have wireless mics there, so if you hold up your hand, um, I'll, I'll just, that's the AV booth, they'll get a mic over to you. Double quick, think up your questions in a second, I'm not opening it up just yet. I have one question for you guys. Right, enough obfuscation, I mean, not that you guys have been obfuscating, but in a simple binary, yes or no, bricks and mortar stores, 10 years from now, Will they exist? Definitely, yes. Why? Because I think that's the human nature as well. You need, uh, I hope it's not a generational uh, point of view, uh, but I, I do believe this will be uh, omni-channel. And again, I'm referring back to where we were 15 years ago. Even if we, the, the, the evolution or the pace of the election goes faster and faster, mm. but still, uh, in most of the businesses, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the share of internet is still way, way, way lower wa yeah. wa than what we thought it would be in 2015. Okay, I'll, I'll refine that question because I think um, the mistake was mine. You're right in what you said, but th basically what I'm asking is, in seven years, can you think of bricks and mortar stores that will not go omnichannel or not also add like elements of e-commerce and swishy screens and so that's a yes, trickier yes, question. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's what it is. You know, brick and mortar will definitely survive provided you upgrade yourself to an omni-channel. You integrate with uh, e-commerce and commerce. Sorry, uh, you integrate with, with what? With e-commerce. With what? <laughs> His best friend. It's, it's, Is your best friend? <laughs> it's a necessary evil, I would it's, say. It's, it's, it's a necessary evil, he says. Yes. Super, <laughs> Nadine. Okay. Well, I don't think it's a necessary evil. I think that is absolutely the way to go. Brick and mortar will survive, and uh, there will be rationalization, no doubt, because uh, there may not be as many stores like you see in the West, where Best Buy and Circuit City, oh, Circuit City has gone off, Best Buy has rationalized the stores. So there will be a bit of rationalization, but brick and mortar stores will be there, but it will be all omnichannel. Everybody will have to be omnichannel. And completely experiential, Comple and completely so 360 degrees, yes. like everything. How about yeah. you, Robert, what say you? Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I think that omnichannel will be the future of the retail. I think retail bricks and mortar stores will absolutely exist. You only need to look at the example of Amazon where they're looking to have retail stores themselves yeah. so that they can actually service the customer. So I think it's for the service, the experience that we actually offer, it will need to be omnichannel, but retail will absolutely be here in the next seven years. Super. Um, one line each, gentlemen, closing comments from you, and I'm opening the floor to questions. So, um, in that closing, actually, I'll ask you something, which is, I think, funny, uh, for me anyway, I don't know if you'll enjoy it. Retail in the Middle East, is it financially healthy? I mean, you guys are quite polished, rich-looking guys, so I'm assuming that it is, but do you think it's financially healthy, or are there cost pressures? 
Um, I think it is financially healthy, but we have to actually be very conscious of cost. I think that retail is a dynamic uh, industry and it is constantly needing to change and adapt, as we've spoken about today, to the customer needs and requirements. Super. Uh, Sorry, I'm just like, this is a one sentence thing because sure. those guys are getting anxious. Overall, Middle East is probably healthy. Uh, UAE, not so much. Uh, okay. There are much more pressures in the UAE because of the higher rentals, higher costs, and uh, lower margins, and right. more brutal competition. More than brutal the rest competition, of the sir. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it has to be run very, very efficiently to make it healthy. You need to make it healthy. I think there are challenges. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a stretch, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the cost, the rising cost in, in the mall rentals and the salaries and everything else. Uh, you know, on one hand, the costs are rising, the margins are declining. Mm. I think it's a, it's a concern for the entire industry, not just for retail. You know, I would say whether retail is healthy, whether distribution is healthy or vendors, p l is healthy, we don't really know. Super. Alain? I think we have to be very creative to make it healthy, uh, but it's not specific to the Middle East region. Uh, all other regions have suffered. It's uh, up and downs, and we have to create the conditions of uh, uh, being able to, be, to do a healthy financial so business. So you empower yourselves to be able to make that difference. All right, super. Ladies and gentlemen, questions from the audience. There's a gentleman there. All right, we already have one and two people wanting to ask questions. Can I get um, there, ma'am? We'll start with, oh, well, she's just passed you by, but that's all right. Uh, this gentleman first. Do introduce yourself. Oh, look, your friend is already giving you your 15 seconds of fame. <laughs> Isn't that great? Okay, um, uh, my name is Adam. I'm from... Uh, from Modern Electronics, uh, Saudi Arabia. And my question is uh, for Jambo. I, I would like to know uh, some of the learnings that you had uh, moving from a mono-brand retailer to a multi-brand retailer. If you can share with us uh, how were you able to challenge the margins, especially where you were vertically integrated in your margins and moving into multi-brand. How, how did it work out with you and the learnings? Sir, can you, can you hold the microphone up closer to your face a bit? Um, yeah. This yeah, is yeah. Much, better. much better. Thank you. Yeah, got it. Uh, well, it was, it was a very big challenge, so we went about it in, uh, in phases. We were, uh, our showrooms were essentially Sony stores for many years, for 20, 25 years. Then we added a few more brands like uh, Nokia, which we distributed at that time, Motorola, HP, Acer. So it was really a collection of a few brands in, in the jumbo stores. So the first step uh, we took was, we, this was about 12 years ago, when we moved retail as an independent business within the company. Uh, earlier it used to be a channel of sales for the distribution divisions. So it became an independent profit center 12 years ago and gradually we started going multi-brand. So mobile phones and laptops was the first category and then uh, two years ago we did the same with uh, cameras, TVs and uh, gaming. So we went about it in phases so the impact on the bottom line was uh, much more reduced and more staggered. And uh, we stood on our feet before actually completely becoming independent multi-brand. Super, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Heap. So that we're, we're going to try and get in as many questions as you can. There was another hand on that table. Um, who was it? OK, you, yeah, sir. This is, and uh, then it's you, sir. Brilliant. Go. Yes, my name is Vasan Bengani. I'm CEO of TouchMeet. And uh, most of the industry here, I think, uh, very well known to us. And my question to Mr. Neelesh, that you are afraid with the online business and all that, and which is growing fast, not here, all over the world. So what the retailers are thinking to make the path, path which, is, which is easy for the vendors so they can prefer you more and more rather than you. What I feel day by day, retailers are increasing their rebate skills, 15%, 20%, 25%. And where the online people, they are working on 3 to 5%. So this is uh, four times you are higher plus merchandise support, plus floor support. So you think that uh, retailers will be managed, will easily manage the competition with the online, or maybe look some solution where vendors should prefer you much better than online. Okay, and who would you like that, who will take that question? No, here, the rest of the First of all, <laughs> okay. let, me, Vasan, let me clarify, I'm not scared of online, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> let me make it clear, I mean, but yes, uh, you know, there are pros and cons, you know, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, online also has a cost, you know, I mean, online is doing extremely well, uh, not necessarily becoming financially uh, healthy as we just talked about. You know, the, the business model of online could be quite different from a brick and mortar retail. 
you know, a lot of online is growing, especially in India, it's only growing and they're playing a valuation game. They're actually not making money in the, from, from the system. And I personally feel that you, a business cannot sustain for too long if it is not financially healthy on its own. <coughs> you know, you just can't uh, depend on the funding of the venture capitalists to sustain a business. So there are challenges. You know, online, um, again, I think I don't want to talk more about that. No, no, actually, and you know what? It was just a light-hearted moment, and I, I, it's my <laughs> fault. I started it. But let's not forget as well that um, online is also not cost-free. Like, if you're asking consumers to put down their financial details, you'd better look like you mean business, right? So there, are, there is, at the outset, it's not as if bricks and mortar, at least that's what I think, it's not as if bricks and mortar have fit out costs, but online is cost-free. No, what would not, you guys say? There, there are a lot there of costs. costs. Yeah. It's hard. Absolutely. There are a lot of costs, and just to add to what Nilesh said, there is no online pure play online retailer in the world which is making money. Amazon, yeah. after 16 years of operations, yeah. still loses all money all the way today. through. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, will I get you a microphone, sir? <laughs> do, you have, what, do you want to ask a question as well? Actually, yeah, bring the mic over. You say that loudly. I like what you're saying. Hello. Yeah, my name is Ganesh. Actually, as I agree with uh, our friend here, Hey, nobody makes money on online end of the day and our friend Mr. Vasant is telling is a challenge of rebates and challenge of investment basically. But you know, the, if, if, if uh, the retailer basically, you know, it's, it's end of the day, the UAE business is uh, large number of retailers are present in the country today with a lot of real estate is costing a hell of a money. And it, it, is, it is a very small market end of the day and here the vendor, retailer and the distributors having a solid association end of the day. And if something goes on an online, 100 percent, we are all going to be in trouble. There's no doubt about it. End of the day, and many times here, the the uh, the leading uh, online retailer in the UAE, which is Sook.com, is really trying to do best of this. End of the day, I don't know how, how whether they make money end of the day here, but yes, it is a challenge, and we all need to face it. As Nilesh said, and I said Nilesh did not say that he's you know he's scared. He said he hate it. He's he's ready to face you know face the challenges. End of the day, I think I'm right. Yes, Mr. Nilesh. Yes, yeah. absolutely. All right, there we go. I think we have a question there. Introduce yourself, sir. Uh, good morning. I'm Lijo from Grids. My question is to both Mr. Nilesh and Mr. Nadeem. How the number of uh, these seasonal promotional campaigns have affected the retail business? I mean, both, both in terms of numbers, value, and P&L. Okay, sorry. Uh, two things, sir. Um, for some reason, I couldn't, um, uh, I couldn't hear your question. So, mic up closer and also tell me who you want um, to address the question to again. Both Mr. Nilesh and Mr. Nadeem. And it's the number of yeah. seasonal promotional campaigns that we have in UAE right now. The number have grown up. So, how it has impacted the retail business? I mean, both in terms of value and might be p &L as well, if you can throw some light. Actually, that's a very interesting question because it was on one of my questions to ask as well. I mean, Dubai and the UAE seems to be a constant clearance sale. I don't know if they have that in Lebanon or in Saudi as much, but here you just bounce from festival to festival. How does that affect you guys? Well, it has yeah. its uh, upside and it has its uh, downside. So more sales events, especially in UAE and Dubai, because Dubai being a, a, a shopping destination, so it's good in that sense that tourists are coming and buying over here. Uh, the local population also needs a stimulant to come and shop. So these events do help. But uh, the downside is what's happened is most of the times your sales and profit graph looks something like it goes like this, goes up, then down, then up and then down. Whereas earlier it used to be more stable. So that's one of the, one of the downsides uh, of this. I mean, you make most of your sales and money in four months out of the 12 months, rather than having a balanced uh, balance sheet throughout the year. Mr. Nilesh. Yeah, I, I think, see, doing an event, doing a promotion is, is overall it is good for the industry because it pulls a lot of share of the pocket into electronics from other categories like mm. food and fashion, frankly. It increases the market size by, by constantly having events and promotions. But yes, you know, at the same time, there are challenges of P&L, there are challenges of cost, uh, there are challenges of uh, logistics to meet those, uh, you know, demand, you know, increase in demand during that period. But overall, you know, the, the category is such, you know, in fact, the consumer, in fact, I, I, I feel that, you know, it's happening too much in the UAE. 
not so much in the rest of the GCC countries. UA is becoming a very, very promotional market. Sometimes we give away to the customer even if he's not expecting it. Frankly speaking, you know, uh, sometimes even cons consumers, you know, they, they are surprised as to how some of the retailers come up with such offers and such promotions. Where is, it, where is it being funded from? So we are giving away something to the consumer which he is not expecting. He would even otherwise buy a iPhone uh, 6 or a S6, he would still buy. But we go out of our way and giving him bundles and offers and gift vouchers and everything to him. You know uh, what, I'm actually no going reason. to open that question up to Alain, you as well, and, and to Robert to get a perspective um, in from other markets, because as far as I'm concerned, like a promotion doesn't make me, doesn't give me any urgency to Absolutely. buy anything. I, I don't because think the next promotion it. is around the corner. We'll go straight from DSF to Jitex to whatever. There'll sure, always be sure. a promotion, like you know. It doesn't matter. But Alain, does that happen to you guys, to Korea or well, Lebanon? The seasonality is completely different in, in Lebanon. You have a high season season in uh, summer because of uh, people coming back to to Lebanon, but. I, I would come back to what um, I mentioned earlier, is to build the trust with the customer. Of course, when you are a shopping destination, a tourist destination, it's, it's a Sorry, different just one second. Game. Guys, would you please put your phones on silent? Um, because your ringtones and your messages keep going off. Uh, would you please do that for me? Yes? Is that possible? Thank you. Sorry, sir. So w when you're shopping or tour tourist destination, it's a different ball game. But um, the risk also is to lose uh, this attractivity because from, from one offer to another, uh, yes, you, you, you're still expecting the next one will be better and, and you just delay uh, your purchase. So um, Lebanon is, is, is a bit a different market. Uh, you don't have that kind of uh, offer all, all year long. All right, Robert, thank you for that, Alain, and uh, Yes, so I, I agree with, uh, with, with the gentleman before me, really, in as much that promotional events are, are great to drive traffic into our stores and to improve brand awareness and to help increase consumer electronic sales during a period. I think that the challenge is that the customer becomes aware of these promotions, activities, and they just wait or withhold uh, buying a product until such time as there's another great offer or another promotion. I think, to the point uh, made earlier, we just need to focus on uh, the service to make sure that customers are actually sort of coming to stores on a frequent basis and that their, their customer behavior isn't driven just by price alone. Price is a hygiene factor and I think yeah. you know, we need to actually differentiate through other areas in our stores. But once a promotion starts, say if DSF starts, can you afford to not be a part of it? Mm -hmm. You can't. Well, I mean, no. that wouldn't you apply to, to you guys, but, you, yeah. but if a promotion no. starts, no, absolutely. Or, you, yeah, you, you have can. to get in there. You have right? to, yeah, you have to be the promotions there, you yeah. have to be a part You don't yeah. just have to participate, you also have to be competitive, because right. you, you can't yeah. lose customers, so yeah. you have to. Yeah. Fair play. Questions, ladies and gentlemen? All right, there's a question here, there's a, oh, there's a follow-up yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but short, please. Yeah, it would be short, it would be short. Uh, Mr. Nareem, you just described a graph with a variation, so what do you do basically is there a retail formula to tackle those dead months wherein there is no promotional activity well we are still searching for that formula because uh, <laughs> thank you because it, it is a challenge and uh, what's happening is the full price sale the number of transactions on full price sale is becoming lower and the number of transactions on promotions is becoming higher so it, that that is a challenge and uh, in UAE of course because of the number of promotions the, the customers also are buying things which they don't need with money that they don't have. So that's also there. <laughs> All right, super. Well done, yeah, well answered there. All right, now there's a question where? There's a question here. All right, if you bring the microphone to this gentleman. Who's next with a question, by the way? You are, sir. Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Faraz. I'm from Reddington Lifestyle. And my question is to everyone on the panel. Comparing the e-retail channel to the brick and mortar stores, now coming to the e-retail, there is no physical space constraint in terms of the number of brands that they can carry. However, when you come to a brick and mortar store, obviously space is a constraint and we see a lot of brands coming into the market um, you know, month after month with amazing products. So as a retailer, what are the key aspects that you are looking for while you know, carrying a brand in your store? Is it the product, the innovation, the kind of marketing support? Is it more of a short term, medium term? What is, what is, the, what is the decision making process for a retailer? Okay, that's actually an interesting one because it brings us back to the vendor distributor, uh, the vendor retailer relationship. And you know, quite often you hear about um, vendors looking for channel partners, but it's quite interesting when channel partners are looking for 
brands to stalk or vendors, what do you guys look for? That's, that's the question, right? Yeah. So let, let's just do that. Uh, let's, let's get everyone involved. Let's start with you, Robert. Yeah, so I think, uh, I think it's a great question. I think that innovation is clearly critical. Any product innovation we'd want to have demonstrated in our stores so that we can effectively communicate it the best we can to the customer directly. I think ultimately, though, we have to actually put the products into the stores that are going to deliver the greatest sales and return on investment for our business. So we're constantly looking and working with our vendor partners to ensure that any product that goes in the store is going to deliver sales expectations for both parties. So product innovation is great. The actual depth of range is another one as well. So where we want to be able to show a dedicated range or, or display of products so that there's a good comparison. Brand equity is obviously important as well. That helps us in the stores to be able to demonstrate that you know, key brands are actually present with their new products and technology. Um, but ultimately, the customer decides. If we can actually see through the website that there are a lot of clicks actually going through on particular products, then great. We know that that product is actually being viewed a lot by customers, so we need to get it into the stores to actually provide it with the ranging. So I think there's an, a number of different factors. Super. Nadeem? Yeah. Well, the first, uh, first uh, thing is, of course, that the product is something that you, you would think would sell well. So if you think that there's going to be good velocity on the product, then you would keep it in store. Uh, we, in particular, we operate small format stores, so we offer a more curated range than some of the others, uh, others do. So we are a little more selective in what brands and what products we keep in the store, which fit our profile of customers. So that's what we do. And as for uh, e-com, of course, uh, one of the advantages of online is that you can have a long tail. So you, can have, you could have 10,000 SKUs, which sometimes you may not even stock, but you could actually just show them to the, to the customer. So there is, there is an inherent difference between that and this. Mr. Story. Nilesh? Yeah, I mean, you know, over a period of time, uh, what, what, you know, once you get into omni-channel, what would happen is some of your brick and mortar outlets will become points of uh, logistics, points of distribution for e-commerce as well. Uh, you know, once you have a good spread of uh, brick and mortar stores across the region, then you can really service e-commerce even better because your logistics cost, your delivery cost will be much lower. Rather than you know di distributing from one point of storage, you will have multiple points of storage. You can distribute from the closest store. But Mr. Neelish, how would you choose the brands to stock? Uh, you know, I mean, okay, the you know. No, because I think that was what the question was basically. That you know, when you guys are yeah. So I mean, we we, we would you know we would again it will be a 80-20 sort of a criteria where you know you stock into the in in your brick and mortar retail, you know what what has more chance to sell rather than just to show a, a, show a range. Uh, you know, whereas on e-commerce, as Nadeem said, you could have a, a complete range, uh, you know, a long tail, uh, you know, not necessarily only that would sell because the cost of carrying something on e-commerce is not that high. You don't pay renters and those type of things. Super. So it is more of an 80-20 formula when it comes to brick and mortar. Pareto optimality, you heard it here first, 80-20. Um, uh, Alain, what's your opinion on this? Well, I think well, most of the rationale have been already uh, said, but I would add what is the, uh, uh, the added value or the value proposal of the product uh, and the brand to, to the customer because you, ha you already have a range existing. So wh what, what's the added value of this specific product? This is what you're going to try to wait and put on the scale versus what you're able to sell to your customer. That's, that's, uh, that's super. Nice. Now, there's a question here, I believe. All right, so l now I'm going to do this question and then I'm going to do a maximum of two more. So I've got your hand here, sir, and there was somebody else. Bag the last question. Who wants the last question? You do. You've already had a question. No, I mean, if it, if, because there's so few left. All right, in the meantime, can we get the microphone over? All right, you start, sir. Go on. Hello, uh, my name is Yasir. I am from uh, distribution, uh, Salam Distribution in Qatar. Uh, I'm actually asking a different question. It's just that uh, it's a great opportunity to have the four uh, gentlemen CEOs here. And uh, um, it's not only the retailers who are having a tough time. I think the vendors are equally having a tough time when it comes to technology. And my question is uh, specific to the handsets mobile business. Uh, I mean, it, what attracted my attention is the comment from the commercial director in Extra, who was saying, just crossed his mind when he did the comparison, he's saying when you have the Apple in one hand and the uh, HTC in the sorry, other Sorry, what's hand. the question, sir? Sorry. The question is, do you see uh, the handsets business continuing as it is today, 
kind of bipolar uh, Samsung, Apple, and then there's a 10%, 20% chance for the rest? Or is it going to be a fragmented business with all the Chinese new brands? When you see Huawei up there, it's, uh, it's coming up and it's coming up strongly. Does this market, in your opinion, right, going sir. to be a bloodshed, fragmented market, or is it continued going to be a bipolar? Thank you, sir. Thank you. So basically, as retailers, your expert opinion, does it still remain a bifurcated market with Samsung on the one hand and Apple on the other? Or is there going to be bloodshed with loads of brands coming in? Uh, very quickly, one-line answers. And then you, sir, in the white shirt will have the last question. I think we're going to have to close this because people have one-to-one -one meetings after this. So um, go on, Robert. Um, a polarized market or bloodshed? So I think that the market is becoming more polarized at the moment with, between sort of Samsung and Apple. And then there's a number of other brands that are actually trying to innovate to actually become uh, sort of part of that, that market. I think that the key, though, is that the mobile phone market is huge. And so there's a lot of market there for, for vendors to actually uh, participate in. I think that uh, certainly our hope is, and we're trying to support to ensure that uh, there are more brands that can come into the market to actually enable more competition. I think we saw periods where BlackBerry were completely dominant with the mobile phone they had and Nokia as well in previous times. No one stays number one forever. And I think that you know, the market will continue to innovate and we'll continue to support that. Sorry, Nadim. Uh, very polarized at the moment, as he said. Uh, even if you look at the vendor profitability, 105% of the profit of the mobile industry sits with just three of the vendors out of the 20 or 25 global uh, manufacturers. So yes, at the moment it's polarized, but we think going into the future, there will be more innovation as the smartphone becomes more ubiquitous, becomes more mass market. So the market size is absolutely huge, which will mean that everybody will have their own share. Mm. Mr. Nilesh, what do you think? Yeah, I think, if, you know, it, it should be, there should be many more brands that should come into the market. If, you know, polarization between one or two brands is not healthy for the industry, I would say. And I think that's what will happen. There will be a lot many new brands that will come in the market. They will have their own market share. They'll have their own marketing strategy and, you know, set up their own shop here. Um, I think that's the, way, that's the way forward. I mean, if we look at any other category, any other industry like fashion, for example, there are more than 200 brands, you know, even in a mall like Dubai Mall, more than 200 fashion brands. So why not in electronics? There should be Fair multiple play. brands and you know, it play. should be a good choice for the consumer to, to, to decide what he wants to buy. Fair play. Alain, um, what's the state of play in the Levant region? I, I think well, that's roughly the same, but uh, well, markets are different, uh, mm. even if there is a, a bipolarization of the market actually, but I, I do believe also that the, the, the technology is changing at a very, very fast pace and uh, Nokia is not here anymore. It was number one uh, in the past. Uh, to, uh, Apple was uh, strong, yeah. became a little bit uh, slower and then uh, took off again. Uh, Samsung, it's the same. So I think uh, there is plenty of room with the size of the market for many other players. Super, thank you guys. Gentlemen in the white shirt, you have the last question of this panel. No pressure, but make it a good one. Okay. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Uh, Rami Khalili from Jordan. Uh, my question is, uh, as, uh, as margins are getting uh, lower, and expenses are getting higher in the Middle East, all over the region. And all big retailers' plans are coming all over in the Middle East. How would smaller retailers survive in this all situation? Okay, actually, fantastic industry question. Is there space for smaller retailers? Because there are cost pressures and there are price pressures. And what do you think? Mm -hmm. We'll start with you, Robert. Yeah, so I think that you're, you're absolutely right. There are, there are significant cost pressures, and I think we only need to look at examples in the West where even retailers like Comet and Phones for You in the UK have actually recently, unfortunately, gone out of business. However, the businesses that have done quite well um, and have actually found a new niche in the market is the smaller retailers where they've become more specialist. So I think that there is definitely uh, room for, for both the big multi-channel sort of retailers and also the, the more specialist uh, independent uh, retailers within consumer electronics, absolutely. I think it's just about those retailers, um, again, just adapting, both the multi-channel retailers and the uh, smaller independents to actually find, uh, the c to deliver what the customer actually needs them to. So from experience, they become more specialist and there's definitely yeah. opportunity and profit in that, in that market. Super, Nadeem? Yeah. Uh, consumer electronics industry, by nature, you need critical mass. If you don't have critical mass, uh, it's very difficult to actually survive. 
but at the same time how to compete with the bigger boys is by more specialization having that differentiation where you actually need one compelling reason for the customer to come and shop with you so when a customer is thinking of buying any product be it a laptop or mobile or a tv what is that one reason why he should come to you so mm -hmm. if you can crack that then there is a lot that there is room for smaller retailers to survive brilliant mr neelish what's your yeah, story I mean, I, unlike any other category uh, you know even in in let's say supermarket business we have seen there are hypermarkets like giant and carrefour but still you know the the medium sized retailers are still surviving the 711s are still surviving you know the likes of uh, al madina and uh, you know al manama supermarkets you know which are uh, in every locality they still survive so i think at the end of the day survival depends on how efficiently you run your business uh, what is your business strategy uh, you know what are your objectives uh, you know you just can't uh, sort of try to follow uh, you know you can't chase other people in the industry if you're a small retailer you have your own niche and you have your own uh, zone within which you need to work Super. and then you can survive so all right mr elaine final thoughts on this question for this uh, i think well uh, as you as you mentioned jordan you probably uh, you know better than me but probably 60 percent of the market is still uh, non-organized trade uh, that's the case for lebanon as well for electronics so correct i think that's still, a very valid point still yes. uh, the small uh, um, retailers are surviving and as uh, as it has been mentioned either it is because uh, they are doing better in terms of convenience in terms of uh, credit facility in terms of personalized approach uh, to the customers and uh, um, we see that the trend of uh, non-organized to modern trade is not changing at a very fast pace specifically in Jordan in Lebanon you have the same phenomenon in, in Iraq for instance so there are still some markets where there is still some room for uh, organized retailer. Super. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a massive round of applause for our panelists. Mr. Robert Wilkins, Commercial Director Extra. Give him a round of applause, please. <laughs> Mr. Naveen Khanzada, Head Omnichannel Retail Jumbo. Round of applause for that gentleman. Mr. Neelish Bhatnagar, CEO at Emax. Thank you very much. Elaine Gwenvek, CEO at Curry House. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Super. Thank you, thank you very much for coming All up right. and sharing your industry Thanks experience. A lot.